Welcome to the Better Podcast, where you and I get better in this game called life. I'm Chin, your co-host today, and I co-founded the Smart Investor, an investment site where we talk about stocks all day. And I'm your co-host, Sir Jing. I run the Good Investors Investment Block and a Global Equities Investment Fund together with my friend Jeremy Chia. Now, before we start, just a disclaimer. Nothing on this show should be taken as investment advice. It is purely for informational and entertainment purposes only. All opinions expressed in this show by us and our guests are solely our own opinions. We and our guests may hold positions in the financial assets discussed in the show, and these holdings are subject to change at any time. Hello everyone and welcome back to episode number 8 of the Better Podcast. So with me here is Sir Jing and myself. Uh, we're recording on 1st of July. And as always, this is an unscripted conversation. We have no idea what we're going to bring up. So take it away, Sir Jing. All right. So I'm going to be talking about a topic that I think stock market investors would be really interested to know about. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will be interest rates. So what I'd like to share is something interesting. So I think the general idea is that interest rates theoretically uh, act as a force of gravity to use uh, one of uh, Warren Buffett's phrases. And what happens is that um, when interest rates rise, um, valuations of various financial asset classes will tend to fall, right? Because um, when interest rates are higher, um, investors get to earn a higher risk-free rate of return. And so the idea is that if I can earn a higher risk-free rate of return, then valuations for other forms of financial assets should theoretically fall. Now, but what's interesting, I think, is that uh, if, you, if you actually look back in, uh, at the data, you might find that there are p- long p- um, time periods where the relationship between interest rates and stocks are not so clean. Mm-hmm. So for example, so I've used um, data that has been maintained by uh, Yale economist Robert Schiller. So um, Schiller um, is a Nobel Prize winner, and he has a database of interest rates and stock prices, uh, earnings and valuations going back to the 1870s. So according to his database, uh, the US 10-year Treasury yield was at 2.3% at the start of 1950. Right? Mm-hmm. By September 1981, this yield, uh, the 10-year treasury yield, had risen to 15.3%. So a nearly 7x increase in the uh, in interest rates, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And 15, this 15.3% yield is actually the highest that is recorded in Sh- uh, Robert Schiller's uh, data set. Now, mm-hmm. over the same period, the S&P 500's uh, price-to-earnings ratio actually started at 7. And mm-hmm. can you guess where it, where it ended up at? Started at seven uh, on what date again? Uh, nine, uh, the start of 1950. So let's call it January 1950. Mm, 15? I don't know. <laughs> 15, you don't know. All right. I mean, so <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you base the change in the S&P 500's valuation on, um, on, the, on the theoretical framework that links interest rates to stock valuations, uh, mm-hmm. Your answer might be that the P ratio will be lower, but it turns out that the P ratio actually moved from seven at the mm-hmm. start of 1950 to eight in September mm-hmm. 1981. So actually, the price to earnings ratio increased. And I think it's worth noting too that the S&P 500's P ratio of seven at the start of 1950 was not a result of having earnings that were temporarily inflated and mm-hmm. thereby giving the impression that the P ratio is artificially low. Mm-hmm. So that's not the case. That's right? So. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, correct. So I thought that this long, so it's like a 30 plus year time period and you have this really interesting phenomenon where mm-hmm. a much higher interest rates actually coincided with a slight increase in evaluations. So I thought that was actually interesting. And yes, I would like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so uh, I did receive a question because uh, recently I made a remark that uh, Warren Buffett uh, actually wrote the Buy America I Am in uh, October 2008, right? And uh, till date, right. uh, I, I think if you look at the NASDAQ, uh, from the moment he wrote that article till today, right? Despite um, that timing of his, his article uh, not marking the, the law of the market, the, the NASDAQ has actually increased by call it around 650%. That was the last number I remembered. Uh, Maybe slightly lower, but uh, even if it's slightly lower, I I don't think that, I mean, the main thing here is that even though 
he was off in his timing. The end result, uh, if you hold the S&P 500 for that period of time was actually pretty good. So there was a challenge and this comes from a membership base and I thought it was um, a pretty good question. Uh, like he's, he's asking, and I, I also think that this is, I think one question in, in a lot of investors' minds, um, you know, he, he's saying that this result was achieved over a period where interest rates were low, right? Or generally low. And what, what, what if we have higher interest rates for a prolonged period of time? And my answer to him was that I couldn't find a time where, um, or, or I have to go back before the year uh, 2000 or the, the con bubble to find a period of time where there's a prolonged period of time of more than 10 years where interest rates were um, you know, higher than usual. But at the same time, if I look back at, you know, before the dot-com bubble, this was a period where the internet, um, and I took a look, I think the number of internet users uh, during the dot-com bubble was maybe somewhere around 300 to 450 million, depending on which source you look at. Uh, we don't have to be really accurate on that. And I, I just feel like that was such a different world back then, right? That you, now today you have um, probably close to 5 billion people on the internet. Um, software companies generally don't need as much KPEX. So my answer was that there wasn't like an exact comparable period because I, I think that once you focus on one criteria, you, the rest of the context gets lost in the discussion. So I, I, I wouldn't compare a period of time where there was no internet versus today where there's internet and so much more people connected. And, and I do think that um, in, in that sense, there's no comparable sort of uh, period where you can show how stocks perform during a period of uh, higher interest rates. Now, the only other period which I found where interest rates were rising was somewhere between, let's say, 2016 to 2019. So roughly about a four-year period. And during this time, I think if you look back, uh, I think many people would have loved to buy shares of Apple or Amazon right after they they uh, revealed that they have this thing called AWS, this little, you know, fun business called AWS, which yeah, powers so control <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which they just revealed uh, in 2015. Uh, and I think this was a period of time where um, a lot of things, uh, you know, the likes of Apple, Facebook, and and, and even Alphabet, they, they were quite uh, protective and very... Uh, as, uh, very protective of what information they share. And, you know, I, I think Amazon was the first to, to let people know that, hey, I have this you know, neat little business called AWS and they started revealing numbers somewhere in 2015. And you, you could also see uh, somewhere in uh, 2016 where Apple's services has started to grow and was going to become a much more predictable business compared to its uh, trend, call it, I hate to call it traditional because it wasn't that long ago. But uh, prior to that, they were much more dependent on the hardware. They still are. But uh, the, the margins of the service business, I think, has, has created this operating profits, which are far higher compared than before. Yep. So um, I, there's another thing that I would like to bring up with regards to interest rates and stocks. And I love like you know what you shared there interest rates, um, or rather rising and high interest rates are something that I think in a modern environment is not something that we have actually seen much of. So, you know, how rising interest rates could affect stock prices, um, I guess would be left, uh, I guess time would tell. And I think the other thing I would like to talk about is that, um, you know, having this idea of making investment decisions on single factor analysis can be really dangerous. Right. So um, again, bring back to this interest rates topic, like if you if again, if you look at the theory, uh, higher interest rates will mean lower stock prices or lower valuations. And, you know, if you if you were to just make your investment decisions, let's say if you go back in time to 1950 and you make your investment decisions back then based upon that single factor, then perhaps you would have missed out on uh, some future gains. Because uh, by 1981, 30 years, 30 years later, despite this huge increase in interest rates, uh, the pre-ratio for stocks actually increased, right? So I think it's somewhat dangerous uh, to, you know, use single factor analysis in 
when operating in the in the financial markets, it's I think always, um nearly always a bad idea to say that if A happens, then B will happen, mm-hmm. right? So it's just um uh, a broader thought that I have as well about uh this interest rate thing, and then another um sticking with the topic uh. I have not actually seen uh, the research uh, written by um, Dan Rasmussen, who is the founder of uh, Redet Capital, but uh, he appeared in a recent podcast uh, in the Investors Podcast Network and mentioned that he had actually done numerous uh, studies on how interest rates would affect asset prices of all kinds, and that would include stocks. And what he found um, was that uh, the direction and the level of interest rates are not a good predictor at all for asset prices. So I actually would love to, to find research on that as well. But um, uh, based on what Rasmussen uh, said, you know, how, where interest rates are and how they move actually do not give, uh, it's not able to, it's not a good predictor of uh, future asset price movements. So I think that's also a really good kind of reminder as well about like, you know, not to, not to use a single factor analysis when thinking about financial markets. Like, you know, yes, interest rates may be rising um, in the future, uh, but that, even if it does, it may or may not be a, a um, good idea to continue to stay invested in stocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like. I think I, I said in the last podcast, I'm I'm somewhat uh, um, afraid that some some of our newer investors would actually take the near term experience which they have and really extrapolate it to the long term uh, because uh, I've seen some emails from people uh, applying for jobs in our companies before where. They have uh, basically stated that uh, rising interest rates have taught them a lesson that they need to be more uh, cognizant of, of what the Fed does and so on. And I really feel that that shouldn't be the lesson to take away from here because there were, I, I know that, um, I, I think we need to recognize that what we're experiencing right now is a period of extremes where there are tremendous swings in, in demand first away from travel and then back to travel. And there have been so many things which happened over the past two years, which are unprecedented, that uh, I, I don't think you want to you want to be really careful uh, in how you draw these lessons uh, because what is extreme might not be normal in the future, right? So I, I don't think you want to draw lessons from extreme situations and have uh, learned them um, uh, or, or pick up the wrong lessons from all these situations. Um, I think we're allowed one brag <laughs> given that we have like eight podcasts so far so i just wanted to share um the other thing which uh yourself and myself have been involved in uh at the motley fold singapore we did uh, pick us stocks from may 2016 up till uh, september 2019 and i'm looking at the us stocks which we picked right which i still track for uh not for ego purpose, but for learning purpose. But uh, for this case, it's a bit for ego purpose. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I'm going to brag a little bit now. So I, I think what we what we did was uh, we basically picked one stock uh, every month from May 2016 and until uh, September 2019, right? And this, and I won't say every month was a U.S. stock, but the vast majority of it was a U.S. stock. And I'm tracking the U.S. stocks now. And I, I think that what's interesting is, as I mentioned just now, this was during a period where uh, interest rates were generally rising, right? There was Brexit, there was uh, Grexit, and all these events happening during that time. But the average um, average stock has or the average return from the stock, even after the NASDAQ has actually declined by more than 30% now, uh, is actually 88%. And if you compare it with then average holding time, so if you take all the stocks that we picked over that period of time, uh, you measure the period and take the average because we are just considering them as equal weightage, then you're, you're looking at around four and 4.4 years of an average holding time. Obviously, some will be longer, some will be uh, shorter, but the average is around 4.4. If you take a simple analyzed return from that, then it's going to be, according to my calculation, 15.3%, which I think is not too bad because uh, that would be better than the S&P 500's uh, 9.4%. Um, roughly... That's surprising. Yep. Given the given the carnage seen in like the higher growth types of stocks, which are a lot of like 
the types of companies that we were picking mm-hmm. when we were at the Mortgage Hall Singapore. Yeah, the other thing I like to measure is the number of multi-baggers uh, as a percentage, uh, just to show people that you can pick many different stocks and still maintain a high return, right? Uh, I, I should also mention that the vast majority of the stocks I'm talking about here are really not the same. They're, they're quite different. Uh, there might be some repeated names, but uh, it's quite rare. Right? And um, around 36% of them are up 100% or more, which I, I thought was... Uh, it's really good for the ego. So yeah. that, that, ends for, that ends my bragging for now. I promise not to brag for another eight episodes. Okay. Sorry, can I, can I just check that the price, uh, the 88% gain that you mentioned, are they prices as of today? Uh, yes, it's updated. Oh, that's, that's actually a, a positive surprise. I would have expected the returns to be lower, but yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> Trust your methods a little bit. Huh? <laughs> Best performer, by the way, it's uh, Apple is up uh, 390% uh, from November. And I think I, if I recall correctly, when we first picked Apple, it was uh, it was already a giant company. I can't remember what the market cap mm-hmm. was, but it was huge. And I think um, at that point in time, there was probably some conversations that Apple was too big to grow, that elephants can't run. Um, but yeah, that's nice to know that Apple is actually like the largest winner there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, if you take the compounded gain, I think it's like 33% per year, which is, uh, I, wow. think, uh, <laughs> I think we would have been happy with uh, 12% per year. <laughs> uh, given what, what's, big, the, yep. what's the biggest loser? The biggest loser for our US stocks will be uh, Alteryx. At, uh, it was down right. 60%. That's that's my pick. <laughs> I I'll take full responsibility for that. Yeah, but um, I, I think the next biggest loser would be uh, PayPal. I think that's mine probably. <laughs> and that's surprising too, given the given how cash generative PayPal is as a business, and given that it's still growing, uh, I guess which shows how um, what interesting times we live in. I and, and speaking about that, I I recall a, a post on Twitter from Mostly Borrowed Ideas, um, this, uh, whose Twitter handle, I think, is MBI. Um, he shared a post recently showing the financial numbers for Facebook from 2017 to 2021, and, or rather, sorry, Meta platforms, not Facebook, mm-hmm. from 2017 to 2021. And he showed that, you know, this, this was a company that actually managed to grow its revenues, profits, and cash flows uh, at a significant pace. And then his next question was, would anybody at, uh, was along the lines of would anybody have guessed that Facebook share price would be flat today? Yeah. Right. So I think um, it, it goes to show how difficult it can be to you know, be picking individual stocks. But I think um, the potential prizes that lie uh, ahead um, make, this, make this whole um, pursuit worthwhile. Yep, exactly. I, I think that um, one thing I, I usually mention um, is that I, I don't really measure my results for to for my ego even though i just went for a little victory lap just now <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i think it's important to measure your results uh to just to see how um what went right and what went wrong because i i do think that the best lessons to be learned are learned over the long term meaning that i try not to derive any lessons from my stock picks unless uh, those results are are over a period of three years or even better, five years. I, I think the better lessons are learned from uh, holding stocks over the long term and, and seeing what sort of lessons you can derive from uh, a three-year mark or five-year mark. So, and that really ties back into you know, not trying to derive any lessons from the last two years, given how extreme situations are. I, I think that um, it could be that the people that uh, you know we got over a little overzealous in 2000, the year 2020 and 2021, and now we might be overly pessimistic. So I, I think that uh, if three years down the road, I suspect that um, we will see that we are wrong on both counts uh, and in the period where we're overzealous and uh, over pessimistic. I'll say it. I'll say it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pendulum of... Uh the pendulum swings from exuberance to pessimism and it often goes way exuberant and way to the end of uh, 
pessimism. So that's what happens uh, in the financial markets. And I think there's just something to be aware of. Yeah. All right, so, what's next? So the, the next thing I wanted to bring out, and you probably uh, listening to the same podcast because we are in the same uh, WhatsApp group. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I thought I'll highlight uh, the podcast from uh, Alex Danko and uh, Patrick o- O'Shaughnessy. And they were talking about token gate token gated commerce and this is going to crypto uh, i'm not so much going to talk about the crypto world itself which is like a whole other topic but i i just felt that it was so interesting that um the numerous concepts which they brought up uh, during that conversation itself right I, I would highly recommend everyone to take a listen i think that's one hour for the first half of this this year right at the risk of recency bias. Uh, I, I think it was the best one I was spent uh, listening to a podcast. Um, I, I'm just going to highlight two uh, concepts which he brought up, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, there's so much more. And again, uh, please do listen to it to capture the, the essence of it. Right. So the first concept is around the idea of constraints, which deconstraint. And it, it falls in the idea of interoperability where uh, Alex makes this argument that um, if you have a system which is free for all, um, there's really no freedom at all, right? And that's counterintuitive because uh, if you want something which is open, you won't you won't automatically think about imposing constraints in order to make it open, right? So I, I think that that was such an insightful view. And it made me think think about these sort of businesses which operate based on this. Uh, firstly, I, I think uh, I, I was thinking that language itself is constrained in a way. If you think about it, there are only 26 alphabets uh, with 26 different sounds. And from it, you can actually derive so many different words. And, um, you know, different people can actually use the same standard of 26 alphabets and create poems, create passages, blogs, and all sorts of things from it uh, without working with each other. There's a common understanding about what those alphabets are. And it, that, that constraint of putting only 26 uh, alphabets is, is deconstraining in a sense that uh, so much more can be built based on these constraints. Um, the other business model, which I thought of, and I don't know why I went to Fiverr, but I, I think that uh, it's quite insightful for the folks at Fiverr where um, being a procurement person itself, I, I think that if you have a free for all market where you have buyers and sellers together, that negotiation period is going to be really painful if there are no standards on, on how you present what can be done? Should the buyer be the one defining or should the seller be the one defining, right? And I think that it was insightful to sort of uh, create a model where instead of the buyer defining what they want, they get the seller to explain what they, they are providing, right? And to me, that's pretty counterintuitive because um, typically you will think that the buyer would be the one who knows what they want to buy. But arguably, the buyer may not know what they want, otherwise they won't be asking for help, right? So I, I, I think that um, having the seller present what they're going to do for a certain amount of money really deconstrains um, the, the amount of freelancing work that can be offered because um, the seller would, is the person who is, or, or the freelancer in this case, they are the ones actually doing the work and will have the most clarity of uh, what exactly they're going to do, right? And to have them explain in very clear terms and to put a value in there, I think is massively deconstraining where it would allow um, um, commerce to happen, where um, this constraints itself enables uh, things to be uh, implemented and, and, you know, different types of freelancing work to be offered, whether it's videos, whether it's voiceovers, whether it's logo designs and so forth. Um, that once you have a certain set of standards which are um, which are carefully picked, then I think that that really helps uh, set the set the stage for uh, massive innovation to happen. Uh, thoughts? Yeah. yeah, no, I do wonder if companies that are supplying like primitive APIs would fall under a similar um, model. Mm-hmm. They may not 
they may not exactly um it may not be exactly you know mapping from A to A, but uh so I so just you know sounding out loud, this is a fragile idea, just and, and my mind is just buzzing from, from what it just said. Um so the idea is that you have a, a bunch of companies that are creating these primitive APIs, meaning that they are constraining in terms of what you can or cannot do with regards to certain mm -hmm. uh, functions, primitive functions they would like to call. Say, I mean, the best examples I can think of would be Stripe for payments and uh, Twilio for, for messaging. So like they are in certain ways constraining um, what you can or cannot do with uh, their APIs. But because everyone else is using uh, these APIs, it then can, it then can go on to... Uh, free people up to think about um, more useful and innovative ideas uh, that can be built upon uh, the primitive APIs. Mm, but actually, now that I mentioned this out loud, it sounds doesn't sound like a really good idea. <laughs> uh, I, I think the way he mentioned it was uh, he drew the analogy of uh, if you let two people discuss on logistics, uh, it's going to go back and forth because they're going to talk about That's right. size of box uh, you know, you're going to use and so on. And, yep. but then if you have a constraint where you, you fix a certain size of box, then these two people don't really have to, uh, uh communicate with other. one another. They can just follow this, uh, similar standard. Uh, the other one I could think of was a Y Combinator where the offer is very clear. Uh, it's on their website on the exact uh -huh. offer they're going to give their startups. And I think that that really provides a, a very clear guideline of what you know the the com companies which approach Y Combinator uh, should expect, right? Um, any more thoughts before I switch gears to the next topic? <laughs> no, I would actually love to revisit this in a future podcast episode, so I shall bookmark that. <laughs> okay. Um, the other <laughs> second concept which I want to bring up from the same podcast was uh, brought up by Patrick. Oh, O O'Shaughnessy, and he was quoting uh, Matt Collar here. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. And is this statement about um, you do not have to predict the future. Um, you just have to notice the present, right? This and is actually, this is actually, sorry, this is actually a concept that uh, Benchmark Capital, um, who is one of the early investors in Uber and a bunch of other like renowned tech companies. Um, it's one of uh, the, interesting catchphrases that uh, they have, uh, that, that its partners have actually shared before. So like the idea is to, you know, just really understand the present really clearly instead of trying to predict the future. But yeah, sorry, go on. I thought that was interesting that I brought that up. And I, I really love this phrase because it, it just resonates uh, with a few things. I, I can think of uh, Jeff Bezos uh, having focus on things which do not change instead of things that change. I, I think one of the most insightful things he said was that he doesn't really think about how commerce is going to change over the next 10 years, but he thinks it's more interesting to think about things which do not uh, change. Uh, for example, it's more likely that people want their items to be cheaper and cheaper, uh, to be delivered faster, faster and faster, and to have greater and greater variety and uh, done in a more and more convenient way. And these needs or jobs to be done to, to uh, sort of uh, quote the late Clay Christensen, I, I think uh, sort of very stable needs which you can build an entire business on. And I, I think he really exemplifies uh, how he focuses on the, all this by not even worrying about their competitors and what they're gonna do because what they want to actually do is try to serve all these needs which are stable and uh, will be there for the long term. The second example I thought about was something which uh, the CEO of Viva Systems uh, recently shared in a podcast by Quiet, where he had this very insightful way of listening to customers, right? And Oh, yes, I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> the back oh, story that, was, that, was, was, uh, that was really good. <laughs> yep. So the backstory was he he uh, he was from uh, Salesforce and he was thinking of creating a CRM tool, which was what Salesforce did, but he wanted to create a CRM tool for the healthcare industry. So uh, solely focused on the healthcare or life science industry, and he went to four customers and basically asked them, you know, or, or presented this idea to those customers, and ironically. All four of them just said, this is a terrible idea, right? Um, 
his insight was that he was not listening to what the customer was saying or, or the feedback that you know this is a terrible idea. And I, I think what he noticed, and, and this ties into to Matt Collins' statement, was what he noticed was that the customers are not very attached to their current product, right? So it's they, they may think that whatever you presented is a bad idea, but at the same time, they're not you know, they're not championing the current solution or in love with the current solution. And to that, that to him means opportunity. There's, there's a way for me, if I can do something much better than a competition, I can, you know, um, sell that idea to you and really get you, um, get your buy-in for that idea. And, you know, cherry on the top, all four of them are currently Fever system customers. So I, I, I just thought that that was, really insightful way of, of thinking about you know businesses today and what sort of needs they fulfill. Now this is I, I think all the different threads that you have mentioned about like you know seeing the uh, present clearly instead of trying to predict the future or trying to think about what would change and so on. I think all of these is um it's it's actually linked to the general idea of inverting, right? So this is a phrase that Charlie Munger loves to say, which is invert always invert, right? So when you think about uh, I think a famous phrase that he has used is, you know, tell me where I'm going to die so that I do not go there, <laughs> right? So I, I think what, if, what they have said, you know, it's, it's all this, um, it, it all, there's this similar thread, I think, that ties all of them together in the sense that it's always about trying to invert uh, questions, thinking about it from, a, from, from the other perspective instead of like trying to figure out, okay, if, um, if I ask my customers, you know, is this product a good idea? And if they say that it sucks, you know, what are they actually really trying to tell me? So I, I thought that was, um, yeah, um, I'm glad you brought it up, actually. It's one of my favorite examples, uh, or, rather, what, or rather one of my favorite stories uh, when it comes to like, entrepreneurship and uh, building businesses. Yeah, I think the other thread I can sort of tie in with is this idea that uh, great stock shouldn't make you think. Uh, the, the idea should be so apparent and, and I think David Gardner, who's the co-founder of Motley Fool, uh, got this from a UX designer <laughs> that uh, you know a great UX shouldn't make the the user think, right? Uh, it should be self-evident. It should be intuitive that anyone who uses your software would be would immediately know how to use it without a manual, right? And I, I think in the same way, uh, if you find a stock which is so obvious uh, with a service which is uh, um, obviously needed which has 10x type benefits, not just 1x or you know, 0.5x, then I, I think that those are the stocks which you want to dig further. It's not a buy signal in any way, but I, I think it's a pretty good signal that um, to, to bring uh, Facebook into the picture. If I mean, um, the competition for Facebook in the past was just newspapers, right? And newspapers cost so much and are so inefficient in the way they spread news. But if, if you have a Facebook, which you're able to narrow down and uh, micro-target your, your customers and what sort of customers you want to look for, then I, I think the service is uh, definitely 10x better compared to the traditional way of marketing. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts to add or should we end here? I think we should. And uh, yep, I'll spend some time thinking about like the <laughs> Alex Denko example you brought up about, uh, you know, co constraints being um, unconstraining. I, I think that's a really interesting, um, I think, idea to pursue in terms of thinking about what types of businesses are out there today um, meeting that kind of uh, criteria. Yep. And those are just two concepts. Just uh, there are so much more uh, which I've drawn from it. And uh, but uh, to keep it short, I, I think those are two of my favorite ideas and concepts shared during that podcast. So uh, do listen, and until next time, see you. Bye, everyone.